to turn it over to our real host for the night. Darlene Herod is an ACLT board member, library volunteer, author, a retired federal employee, and one of the researchers for this project. So please welcome you. Hope you will enjoy it. Thank you very much. 
Before talking about our, the Parker Street Carriages Trail, I would like to mention a few things about my family's connection to Parker Street. My dad, George Henry Broom Harold, repeatedly told his children that his father, George William Harold, was born in Parker's Creek. Sadly, Dad's father died when Dad was only 14 years old. Dad also repeated that his relatives were the Harrods, the Wallaces, and the Commodores of Parker's Creek. A few years ago, it put a big smile on my face when I found out from Gladys Wallace Jones that we shared the same great uncle, Uncle Roosevelt Harold. Yeah. Uncle Roosevelt was married to my father's mother's sister. He was indeed a favorite uncle of mine. So, what is this American Chestnut Land, American Chestnut Land Trust Heritage Trail Project? It will present the history of the Parker's Creek area to visitors through trail signs and web pages. ACLT has over 22 miles of trails, free to all. All are welcome, all belong. Although the project looks at all aspects of regional history, there is a special emphasis on African-American families and experience. The contributions and successes of black residents in the face of injustice and many obstacles have never been properly celebrated. This evening, we will present a few samples. Most project research was carried out from 2021 to 2023, and some continues as work proceeds. We have a loosely organized team with about a dozen workers, including Shirley Knight and myself, Kirstie Unalaw, and Carl Fleshauer, who will speak in a few minutes. Most of the team members are unpaid volunteers. I want to send a special shout out to Shelby Cohen. Does anybody know that name? Yes. <laughs> Shelby is not officially a member, but she has provided excellent documents. Shelby has roots to the Harrods of Calvert County and currently lives in Philadelphia. The first signs and web pages were installed in December 20, 2021. Many more are planned for 2024. I understand that we're going to have another gathering after all the signs are in place. We are grateful for the funding support from the Maryland Heritage Areas Authority, part of the Maryland Historical Trust, and the Maryland State Department of Planning. This project is one element within the Southern Maryland Heritage Area. Is there anyone else in the room who has roots in Parkers Creek? Would you raise your hands? Yay! <laughs> Three or four 
was the one that got me started on this uh, particular topic. Uh, it was all news to me. And just as Darlene said, Shelby Cowan has done a terrific job of doing some detective work at the National Archives. And she turned up some invaluable source materials for this particular one. And I know Michael Kent's here, so I'll tip my hat to him. I benefited from the article he wrote about Civil War soldiers in the 2011 issue of the Calvert Historian. And it's worth saying the talk I'm doing is actually a summary of an article that I put together for the 2023 issue of the Calvert Historian. And uh, with luck, uh, the executive director, Josiah Wims, will be here and have a few copies for sale. This is a story about Joseph Wallace from Calvert County. He enlisted in the Union Army U.S. Colored Troops in 1864. One of his military records has this little note that I've circled, free, April 1961, which indicated that he was, to use the term of the time, a free black as of 1861. And that made him eligible for a $300 bounty above and beyond his pay. Wallace was wounded during the Battle of the Crater in Virginia. This battle included one of the largest concentrations of African American troops in the Civil War and, due to poor leadership by white officers, they suffered heavy casualties. Later in life, Wallace's leg injuries on Cemetery Hill qualified him for disability payments in addition to his regular pension. Some of what we know about uh, Joseph Wallace comes from census and land records and a newspaper obituary, but the most significant information comes from pension files that Shelby Cowan found at the National Archives. Not online, you gotta go there in person for these. These records tell us as much or more about Joseph's wife, Arabella, since they also document her quest for a widow's pension after Joseph's death in 1909. In this deposition, part of the pension-seeking process, we learned that as a child, Arabella had come with her mother from Island Creek Parker's Creek. A deposition from a woman named Lucretia Perrin tells us that Arabella was enslaved by a woman named Rebecca Howe Clare, who lived on a farm between Parker's Creek and the road to the steamboat landing, now called Dares Beach. Perrin states that Arabella lived with a slave named Jim Parker, who belonged to a family named Taylor, and had been hired to work out for Mr. Dare. And, Perrin says, Arabella had a child by June Parker named Mary. In her deposition, Arabella said, June Parker was working on the farm and came around to see me. I slept in the little log kitchen, which was separate from the house. There was a bed in there. He came in sometimes and slept with me in the kitchen. He had to get up very early to go to work. Rebecca Howe Claire asked me who the father was when Mary was born. I told her. She paid the doctor woman who delivered me. She had right smart to say, Miss Howe did, said I had done wrong. You might ask of the enslaver who really did the wrong here. Soon Jim Parker escaped his enslavement. We believe that he is this Jim Parker. Arabella said he was caught and sold to somebody down in Georgia, and I never heard from him anymore. Arabella emphasizes her lifelong bond with Joseph. Joseph H. Wallace and I lived together as man and wife until he died, she says. In the end, she got the pension. Her daughter Mary became part of the household uh, in eight, by 1870 and soon the couple had a growing family. Joseph and Arabella were formally married in 1877. A pension deposition quotes Jerry Boots as saying he was, quote, 
present when the two were married to each other in the Parker Street Church. I heard the ceremony said by the preacher, Reverend Charles Walker. We assume this was an early version of the Methodist Church, later known as Brown. In the 1880s, Joseph Wallace bought his first property, about 60 or 70 acres, located north of Parker Street, and the family moved to their new farm. By the way, a lot of the place names on there are today's place names, not the 1880 ones. In 1901, Joseph Wallace bought a second property, deeded as containing about 200 acres. We're just a little uncertain about the boundaries, but this map is our best guess. During his life, Joseph Wallace made valuable contributions to his community. He was a trustee for both Parker Street School, established with support from the Freedmen's Bureau, and the church. The 1867 deed for the school lot was not properly executed, and it was redone in 1884, and the school lot was then conveyed to, quote, the trustees of the Methodist Episcopal Church of Parker Street, later known as Brown. Wallace is named as a trustee on both deeds, uh, school trustee and church trustee. Joseph Wallace was also a member of the Order of Galilean Fishermen, a benevolent society that established homes for orphans, the elderly, provided funds for the sick and widows and funerals. After the Civil War, Calvert County was home to a few Galilean fishermen tabernacles, one of which was associated with Brown's Church, as you can see in this Calvert Gazette announcement from 1911. Later in life, Wallace's health began to fail. In March 1908, he sold 100 acres of land to Arabella's childhood friend, Mary Brooks. Relying on circumstantial evidence, we believe that another 20 acres of land was transferred to Joseph and Arabella's son, William. William moved to Baltimore the land was lost for non-payment of taxes, but after an intervening owner, it was bought by the Sims family, whose heirs and descendants still own it today. Joseph Wallace passed away in 1909. His funeral at Brown's Church received notice in the Calvert Gazette, giving his age as 73, indicating a birth year of 1836. Quote, the Order of Galilean Fishermen, of which the deceased was a member, and many others attended the funeral. Arabella sold two small lots after Joseph's death, one to the Galilean Fishermen, probably for a building, but we've not turned up evidence that it was ever constructed. Mm -hmm. After Joseph's death, his son Daniel took over the farm on the remaining 150 acres. But as the Depression began, taxes were not paid. And in 1934, the land was sold at the courthouse auction to the physician, <coughs> the physician Hugh Ward, Dr. Hugh Ward. Daniel continued to live on the property as Ward's tenant farmer. Responding to the Depression, the state of Maryland established a board of aid and charities with county-level offices. Daniel Wallace received what was called relief. The terms of this were pretty burdensome, to say the least. Daniel was provided with a workhorse that he had to pay back the full cost in 15 months. He had to agree to plant, harvest, cure, and market a specified crop of tobacco. In what were called slack seasons, he was obliged to work on a county job 30 cents an hour. Now, not much relief, if you ask me, but the impact on Daniel Wallace was short. He passed away in 1936 at the age of 59. I regret ending this story with kind of a sad ending, but thank you for listening. And Darlene, let me turn it back to you.
This is Yvonne Wills, Yvonne Mason Wills, and this is Ruth Parker, Ruth Becky Parker Harrod. Here she interviewed my nephew, Sean Harrod. So we'll get to the video now. My name is Sean Harrod, um, born and raised in Calvert County, 1971, February 27, 1973. Um, I guess the interest to the history starts with our roots, you know. Uh, I like to say, um, you know, your story never starts with you. It always starts long before you. And it all makes up who we are so that we're kind of like an amalgamation of the people before us. <clears throat> they, they develop our sense of self even before we even know who we really are. And so there are pieces of us. Well, I'll just say this. There are a whole lot of people sitting in this chair. A, a lot more than Sean. I think that there are pieces of all of these people that came before us that make up who I am. Even my DNA says it. And so with that being said, um, I think that's what kind of sparked my history, my, 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 my hunger for history, because, you know, I'd hear pieces of things my grandfather said or my maternal grandfather said, and, and you start to put the pieces together. And then you start to hear the stories, and then you listen to other people's stories, and your stories kind of start to intertwine. Either they sound alike or they're actually connected. And so these connections spark this interest, almost like electricity. It's just this, um, the connectivity it becomes conduction, you know, so it's, it's conduit. And, and before you know it, you know, there's this life, I don't know, it's, it's its own living, breathing organism. And, it's all, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and even though it's past, it's still present because it makes up the present. And I hope I'm not talking in circles, but you, you feel where I'm coming from? And, um, I think uh, the earliest story I remember my grandfather saying to me, he said, uh, he said he remembered his, I guess it would have been his great grandfather, who was a slave, and his name was Jake Broom. And he said to me, he said, he said, he said he's a high class Negro. He said he was the first person to write his name on the Freedmen's Bureau in slavery. And he said he actually remembered him to the place where he was there present while he was growing up. And that kind of like got me, you know? And then my, my maternal grandfather could just begin to rattle off his family tree back to slavery. In Pulp Thirty, 1934. Okay, okay. Where did you go to school? Well, I went to Pulp Street School, and then I went to Olive Creek, which was Brooks High School. Oh, all right, mm -hmm. Brooks High School. Um, did you work? Did you did you work? Yeah, I worked most of all my life, right old on the cliff. Mm -hmm. Doing and, what? Uh, just housekeeping, and I always set up tables and polish silver, and you know did. Person, been ported and things. Yeah, when I started working, I was 12 and wasn't quite 13. Because mm -hmm. they had built a uh, Sunscript Service Company in uh, 1937, but I wasn't old enough to work then. But Mr. Gravis, he was the head man that built Sunscript, started Sunscript, is a hobby. Mm -hmm. And he had a mother, and we all, black. Called her Granny Gravit. <laughs> Granny Gravit was too old to leave in the house by herself. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a, a regular phone. We had the phone that we could just call around the community. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Miles was Mr. Gravit's sister. She asked my mother to let me come down and sit with Granny Gravit. So Granny Bradley wouldn't be alone, 
So when she went different places, that if anything happened to Granny Grabber, mm -hmm. that I could always contact her and tell her to come home. And when I started working there, Mama was a woman that know how to do most of everything and was a good housekeeper. Mm -hmm. And when I started working there, I wasn't there in no time, so they had me doing everything. <laughs> <laughs> they had me making the roast of lamb. They had me making cream potatoes. You put your butter and milk in there and cut the potatoes and cook them. And then put them in that cream potatoes. You had me uh, shuffle corn mm -hmm. and bone the corn. Mm -hmm. And they had me slice tomato. And on the porch, I had a table facing the water. Had me setting up the table, because I know how to set the table, <laughs> for 16 people wow. and serving on Saturday when I wasn't even 13. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked there up until I got married. Um, Uncle Charles, and so uh, they built a house in there in the, in the 80s. Um, before then, he lived um, off of Stokely Road, farm on a track of land and uh, share crop the weather, which was fun too, you know. Uh, but when he when he moved to Parkers Creek, there was a, a development, small housing development that just kind of came in there and off of uh, what they call it, I think it's Bicentennial Court. And uh, you could tell that there was, there had to be a meshing of societies then because these people were outsiders coming inside of a, their, you know, what they called the creek was its own place, you know. Even to this day, you know, it's still its own place, you know. Um, and, uh, and I remember my cousins saying, you know, they had, they had to take a little bit of time to get acclimated to the, Society because they were different and they, and they and they and um say you know because they were outsiders even though their families were from there that uh, there had to be some adjustments they had to get uh, sort of kind of get uh, vouched for which is weird because um, when he, when they came there because they had been separated for so long they were under, they were under the impression that they were separate Herods. Yeah, that, that there was this one set and we were this one set. You know, and that's not the case here. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so he buried out there. Then Clover lost her son. You know, that's that money in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he buried out there, Trayvon Wills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we bought Carl there. Mm -hmm. Now we could have buried Carl other places, but mm -hmm. we wanted the family to be together. Mrs. Herod 
didn't get it. Let me tell you, she, Mrs. Heard, was so sharp. Yeah. She was correcting them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sadly to say, Mrs. Heard passed on December 25th, happens to be my birthday, 2023. Before we left, Shirley and I left, we said, can we come back and talk to you some more? We really did want to go back and see her again, but it didn't happen. By the way, is Frank Francis Herod here? Mm -hmm.
distance south of Brown's Church, if you know where Brown's Church is. And uh, it's a lot that uh, has now come into private ownership, and I think there's a private residence built on it. And it's worth recommending Mary Rockefeller's book about schools in Calvary County, which is an excellent compendium, and it has a map that will show you right now. There's a uh, cabin on ACLT property, the Wallace Cabin. Is that connected with the Wallace family that you were just speaking of? Yes, that house was owned by Lemuel Wallace. Right. Mm -hmm. And how, what is that relation to Joseph? I'm proving I spent more time on the census records than anybody else. It's, we would love to have more information. That's my way of saying it. We don't know for sure. <laughs> Lemuel was born in the 1850s, and his father was, I'm going to say Basil, but I don't know if they said Basil or Basil. And he was born, I don't know, 1810 or 1820, something like that. And I've never quite figured out whether he was a free black or enslaved. Joseph Wallace, we have two competing versions of who his parents were. The pension record depositions name a couple whose first names escape me that I've never found a trace of in any census records, and I'm wondering if there isn't something garbled. The census records point to a mother who goes into the 1840 census as a free black woman, Jane Wallace, and uh, by 1860, she turns up with a husband then named David, so it's possible that Jane and David Wallace. But that, again, is a people who were born in around 1810 or something like that, and connecting the dots between the Basil Branch, or Basil Branch, and the whatever their names are branch, we've never been able to do. It's hard not to imagine that the families aren't related. We just haven't found the link. Thank you. Yes, sir. As you hike the uh, Parker's Creek Loop Trail, on the right-hand side of a couple of places, you see some uh, rundown uh, buildings. Uh, have any of those been uh, linked to to the, to the Wallace uh, family? Or? Yeah. Embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> to say, I'm having trouble remembering where the Loop Trail. Is. <laughs> Let me see. Greg, help me. North out. side is the Loop Trail. North side. North side. North side. Parker Street Road Trail, and then oh. the Creek, and then Turkey Trail. Okay, the Turkey Trail, actually this is a good question, because <laughs> I'll follow up with a question back. There's a very dilapidated structure, part of which is a log building on the Turkey Trail, and it was the home of the Scales family. And the leading member of the Scales family was a man named John Walter Scales, who died in the 1940s. He was there in the and 20s. And, uh, sorry, I'm not getting close enough to it. And we have not encountered relatives of John Walter Scales. It's interesting. He turns up, he was a storekeeper and ran some kind of a little lunch counter or lunch restaurant in Prince Frederick. I'm indebted to Michael Kent for that information from his uh, book about the, Carl, the county. And, uh, sorry, anyway, that particular building is a, the John Walter Scales house, let's put it that way, and uh, it's, it's an extremely interesting piece of architecture, and it's a darn shame that it's completely collapsed. Questions? There must be more questions for Carl. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you should see whether people here would uh, want to ask questions. Yeah. 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 Y
like you to come around and visit. Oh, yeah. That would be fun. Are there any people here who would like for me to come around and uh, interview you? We'd love to come by. It doesn't have to be Christmas Eve, but <laughs> we'll come by. Just say when. Just raise your hand. And you can, it, there's actually a sign up sheet outside to get more information about the Parker Creek Heritage Trail. But there's a column to check if you would like to share information about family you know or what other stories you have at Parker Creek. But Calvert Library also has an oral history project, and so we will also take your stories. We have um, some volunteers working on that project. Is, is Brett here? It, Brett is here. Um, Brett is one of our volunteers. I don't know if Brittany's here or not. Oh, Brittany's here too. Yes, that's right. I saw her earlier. Um, and so we have some volunteers working on that project. So if you have stories to share, check that box. And um, I see someone in the back has something to say. I can get to you. I actually have a question. Um, I wasn't here early, so maybe you all have already gone over this. Um, was there any information about how the Harrah family got into Parker's Creek? How the Harrah's got into I'm asking because I'm one. Yeah, I'm one too. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is, I don't know. Okay. Uh, do you know? I don't know, but I do know some married into Parker's Creek. So my mother was not Hawaii. Where did your mother come from? My mother came from Plum Point. Oh, good. Yes. And she I'm married my father, father, who was Siva's boss. So she, that's how she, she was from Plum Point. She was the Boots. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So Yeah, my father and mother both were born in Plum Point. So... But like I said, my father's father died when he was only four days old, so we just didn't have a lot of connection to what was going on in Parker Street way back then. So I would also like to say, if you have relatives or loved ones that are buried at Browns United Methodist Church, let me know, because I would love to have that information to include in the multi-purpose center when it's completed. So if you have loved ones, Many of the grave sites there don't have um, headstones, mm -hmm. so we don't know everybody that's buried there. So if you know loved ones that are buried there, let me know. Well, I just got my grandfather's death certificate, and it said he was buried at Parker's Creek Church. Mm -hmm. that's so that's you. So he's one, George William Herrick. I don't know what else you need on him, but definitely. Yeah, if you have a copy of his death certificate, mm -hmm. any of that, I would love to have that to include in the Sure, arms. you're welcome. I'll, I'll get it to you. And if you need my email address or telephone number, I would be happy to give it to you. Thanks. So there were boots in Plum Point. You say Gladys. Your yes. mother was a boots. Yes. I went to school with some boots. You remember Darlene Boots? She may have been called something else. She's on the school website. Okay. Uh, I'll have to let you know if... She's under another name on the Sewell website. And she lived in Dare, on Dare's Beach Road. Her mother is Campbell. Campbell, what's her first name? May Campbell. Yes. Apparently, the people, the, some of the Harrods, well, I'm only going to use the bridge. You know, there used to be a bridge back in the day. So I guess. Somehow or another, they came over that bridge and came up to Plum Point. Um, they got there because Hilton is here. Hilton's family lived in Plum Point. His father is Owen, Owen Harrod Sr. So my grandfather and Hilton's grandfather went to Plum Point to live. I guess because of the, the industries there and the fishing, the farming. My father grew up on the Neal estate and did sharecropping. Yes, Randy. Uh, did y'all notice the um, difference in the pronunciation of names? Sorry. Yes. But I think you use the bougie version of the Herod. <laughs> no, I guess. <laughs> right. This, this but Delonte was saying Harrod, right? And then other people say hard, so the 
every part was kind of new for me. Because when we were in school, the only thing we always said, Yes. Hard. Yes. Yes. For me. So I was born in, you know, the, you don't know why it's like three different pronunciations. Well, the reason why I say Harry is because of the department store in London, England. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Miss Becky were tight, right? They were, they tight. were really good friends. Yeah. And then I think probably Gladys's mother as well. Gladys' mother was her sister-in-law. Oh, okay. Yes. So you heard the question, Deloitte and others. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say anything about growing up in I have the mic back here, Mr. Owen. All right, Mr. B. I am going to ditto um, Sean's story and Garrett. I, we went to the Palm Street in the 80s also, and Bicentennial Court is where we live. And Frank and his little friends and everybody, they told us straight up, we don't belong. <laughs> don't need to get out of here, y'all don't belong here. But eventually we became great friends. Um, Frank's mom, Becky, she was awesome, awesome cook. That's why her girls are such a great cook. Um, but she taught me to do the rice pudding um, about maybe six years ago. And I'll, I haven't mastered it, but it is great. And I, I, I like to, but, but so many stories that I can tell you about running down the hills, going to Gate A, going to Simon's Cliff, um, the white cars, Frank's brother. Richard Parker, Cleo's brother, all the, the Palm Street family, we became very close. Eventually, I met Woodrow Wallace's son, um, 29 years ago. Grandson. Grandson, I'm sorry. Grandson. Grandson. Um, <laughs> but we became great friends with Palm Street, and we no longer were outside of but for a long time, we were outside. <coughs> that was B. Weems speaking. She's married to Bucky Weems. He's in the book. Yeah. I'm just going to Hi, Bucky. F food was a, a theory, theme there. You might mention your cookbook. Oh, thank you so much for reminding me. everyone, y'all. I'm Cleo Parker, uh, sister of Ruth Parker, called Becky, uh, Aunt Kelly May. Uh, my grandfather, grandfather, Seacrest, and Hattie, and all. And I grew up in Johnny Cliff. My uncle, my grandfather, all of them raised the bathroom. I can remember going over what we call grandmother. That is up past, out that gate, make up left and go all the way back around. And they had a big bone when the hurricane blew it down. But the field all was there and it was told to me as you know, growing up that houses was all along that side was Commodore because my grandmother's grandmother's house was up on the hill where we used to go collect bricks to put in our bed for the morning stove, eat them, wrap them in a towel, and warm ourselves up in the winter. And all of those good things. But all during my lifetime, up until the present, all of that was consisted of Wallace and Commodore Lane. One would join one from another. From that point, down court, we call Big Swamp, were brought you up where Aunt Nanny and Alan used to live and all of them. And so all around where Bicentennial and Court, where it connected, that was all, that was all. While the comic book, when I was growing up, never heard of all of this other stuff until I was here. You know, you know, you know,
and all those who even know our family. And then when Richard got out quick and all how we was all brought together. And up in Pasadena, a lot of our family left there and went up there. And we all they all had the same name because the names were carried over and over. Had it, Bella, had it, me, had it, had it. All those things, how life travels, our family now, you got heard all kinds of names. Some of them I ain't never heard of life, but it is because it is. Because it changes to a new and a, a different, uh, uh, what you want to call it, his boy. Um, things, how things have progressed, mm -hmm. like the computers, the cell phones. All of those things. But what we had, a chain, a phone that had everybody inside a split, oh, no. all connected. You had to wait till that person to get off the phone. <laughs> uh, we used to tell them, y'all come up here and party. We would ask them to get the refrigerator running. And they would say, yes. We say, you better go catch it. That's how we get them off the phone. So we could make a call.
tell your stories, it's going to get longer. But on the back of the book are two books that Darlene authored from the library on inspiring African American men and inspiring African American women in Calvert County. So also available online or you can purchase from the library. So since we're talking about books, the latest book that my team and I produced is a cookbook for the American Chestnut Land Trust. It's on, it's, a, it's on sale today in the lobby here. I would really, 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 really appreciate it if you bought a copy tonight. And you can pay by cash, check, get a QR code. We have the flyer with the QR code. Some of you have already bought our book. I thank you very much. But you might consider getting more for Christmas gifts for next year. Is that rice pudding recipe in there? Do we have a rice pudding recipe? I can't remember if we have a rice pudding recipe in there, but I have my lemon pound cake recipe in there. <laughs> and uh, we have um, woodchuck gumbo. You know what woodchuck is? Yeah. A groundhog. Yeah. And we have smothered muskrat. <laughs> so we have a variety of recipes in that book, and we've, we've got a lot of recipes from the local folks. So we have a lot of local recipes in there. But if you don't want those uh, recipes, we, we listen, I made sure we had a, a lot of recipes in there that were for greens and, and salads and vegetables. And, and the latest and greatest recipe I just made from the book is called Sweet Potato and Turnip Comfort Casserole. It is delicious. But are there any bougie recipes in there? Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> I'm sure there are. We have 277 recipes in the book in eight different category types. So please consider getting a cookbook. Thank you very much. Anything else? Good evening, everyone. My name is Phyllis Harrod. Dawkins, and I too got it from the Harold store. So, so uh, growing up, my, my grandfather is C, was Cephas Wallace, uh, my uncle Woodrow, that's in the in the book. Um, growing up as, as a child, we, we, we grew up, people thought money, but, but love. We shared uh, crops. My grandfather was uh, a gardener. He his his he had watermelon um, on my door. We'd go in the watermelon field in the, in the summer, and we would actually, my grandfather would actually mark the ones that he was going to, to pick, the right ones. So we as kids would go down in the field and kind of open up ourselves, not without any kind of you know, knife or anything. We just kind of busted them up and ate them. So, so we got in trouble a lot growing up. My grandfather also had a beehive. He, he raised his own honey. So we would go and get gravels from off the road and actually throw the gravels at the beehive. Some of us got stung, some of us got away. So, so growing up with, with my grandparents, mom, we call her mom, but Hattie, Hattie Wallace, we, she was a mean, I mean cook, she was excellent. She could have had her own restaurant. That's how good they were. And my mother, Helen May Harrod, well, well, Helen May Wallace Harrod, she was an excellent cook. And you talk about rice pudding? There's none to compare. My mother's rice pudding could have gone in your book as well. But as kids, we did things. That's why a lot of our family, Uncle Dickie, Wins Cole Wallace, was a builder. He built um, many homes in the Scientist Cliff area. Um, still standing today, we, he put his mark on the, um, the, the, the uh, fireplaces. If you go inside this list, there's fireplaces that my uncle, Uncle Dickie, actually built. So a lot of our, our boys, our cousins, they, they were carpenters when they didn't even know they were carpenters. Because as kids, they would build. They would build little houses. We made our own go-karts. We could put bikes together that were broken. So, so growing up, we, we, we had a rich, rich life. And the love that was shared 
um, going even even back then to our house, and and, and uh, my grandmother's um, sister. Well, she adopted me, so I would follow her wherever she needed or wherever she was going. I would be the little kid following her to the little outhouse or whatever. But even those things as kids, it only made us better. That's who we are today. We came out of a rich, rich family. Uncle Cephas Wallace, my grandfather, took no stuff. You either had respect. If you didn't have respect, my grandfather knew what the hand was. I know because he got me once or twice. But you learn, you learn from that. And I am thankful to growing up in Scientist Cliffs and going down to the water. Um, Dr. Jet was, was another property that was my grandfather's. And Dr. Jet would always have company. And it didn't matter to us whether he had company or not. When we wanted to go down to the beach, we'd go to Dr. Jet's and say, listen, can we, you know, can we go down? Not today, he said, because we have company. But anyway, we would work our way down to the, to, to the water where we got, you know, when we, we had the permission to do so. So, so in, back in the day, all of us, anybody that was from Scientist Cliff, we had a rich life. My, my grandmother raised, um, when she did her vegetables or whatever, in the summer, we actually have to peel the, the apples and whatsoever have you. And that's why we are the best cooks that you could ever want to today. Anybody from Scientist Cliff, ask them. They will add rice pudding, cakes. We got it all from our parents and those that instilled in us respect. And that's why today there's so, so much richness in Scientist Cliff. So thank you so very much. I'm honored to have spoken tonight because Uncle Dickie, Uncle Woodrow, Hattie Wallace, all of them instilled in us some richness. Thank you, Phyllis. Phyllis and Delois are sisters. So would you all consider doing an interview? Of course. Yes. Yes. Of course. So I'll remind y'all that there is a sign-up sheet outside the room. You can put down that you'll be interviewed or that you want more information on this project. So, yeah, please do it. Oh, I do remember now that we do have a rice pudding recipe in the cookbook. It's, it's from my pastor, Bishop Robert D. Watts. Have you tried it? <laughs> no, I haven't tried. Maybe we need a rice pudding competition. I'm not, yeah, I'm really, I'm really not into rice pudding all that much. <laughs> if there are no more questions, we will be adjourning on whatever you want to call it. Well, I'll just say, first of all, I'm going to say food matters, stories matter, Community matters, and thank y'all for coming today and sharing about this community. And I hope this sharing continues, and that you keep telling your stories and keep talking to each other. Even if you don't do an interview with us, tell it to your family members, tell it to your friends, pass it on because it really counts. And thank you so much to Darlene, to Shirley who's not here, to Carl, to Kirsty, to Jose. All of this And there's still cookies in the back, so thank y'all for coming tonight.